Good morning, Life Journey Church. So good to see you guys here today. Spirit of God is already with us, moving among us. You heard the scripture, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And in another passage, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. I want to talk to you today from the subject, speaking spirit, the power of your subjective word. Speaking spirit, the power of your subjective word. Repeat after me, I am a speaking spirit. I am a speaking spirit. Yes, I am a speaking spirit. You are a speaking spirit. This means that the intentions, desires, beliefs, and words that come from you are powerful and efficacious, producing an effect. As a speaking spirit, the intentions, desires, beliefs, and words that you release are producing an effect. As a speaking spirit, your energy field gives off a message that attracts and repels situations, circumstances, and events, and people. As a speaking spirit, the subjective word that you form creates your reality. Your subjective word has power. Repeat, my subjective word has power. And so if my subjective word has power, if this is truth, then we must exercise our God-given authority to intentionally manifest well-being, life, and love. Now, I intend to take you through the scriptures and show you that according to the word of the living God, your subjective word has power. See, I believe in practical Christianity and spirituality. Give me something that I can use that I can apply to my life here and now. And I'm grateful that here at Life Journey, we get that every week. Amen. Thank God for Pastor Jeff for the opportunity to speak before you today. Grateful that they are back from their vacation. And um, it is a privilege and an honor to stand before you. It would not be if it weren't for Pastor Jeff, so I thank you, sir. As, as I enter my final year at Christian Theological Seminary, I am fueled and pushed by this personal ministry mission statement that has come to me a few years ago, and it stands true now. It's been adapted, but here it is. My personal ministry mission statement is raising the consciousness of humanity to the heavenly reality, revealing the Christ within by manifesting heavenly music, teaching divine truth, and building communities of love and acceptance amongst diversity. But the crux here at my own personal mission statement is raising the consciousness of humanity to the heavenly reality, revealing the Christ within. There is a divine something within you. But sometimes life has ways of keeping us from being aware of the greater reality within. And so as we look at our first scripture passage here, we're talking about the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. What happens when we are all in one accord and in one place? Something powerful can happen. Something dynamic can happen when we are all in one accord and in one place. What happens when there's a unity of spirit, a unity of heart, a unity of mind, a unity of belief? It creates the opportunity for the Spirit of God to do fresh things in our lives. This is why it's important that when we come together in worship, our intention and our Focus is pointed, and it's together, because in that moment, we are opening ourselves to what God can do in our midst. You know, worship is affected by you and me. We all impact what happens here. God moves, but our allowing of what God can do has everything to do with whether our spirits are closed or whether they're open. And there's a posture that we can take in worship that allows 
God to move in ways that God wouldn't move were we closed up. And so today we've already begun to experience an opening up of what God can do in our midst. As we look at Acts 1, Acts 2, verse 1, the day of Pentecost, it's, it's Pentecost is the 50th day, the second of the three great Jewish feasts. It's celebrated at Jerusalem every year. It's the seventh week after the Passover, and it's in grateful recognition of the completed harvest. Here we see that Jesus is doing amazing things. Before this takes place, Jesus foretold what would happen. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, and see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Jesus is saying this to Jesus' disciples after the resurrection. So we see the resurrection as what? The culminating work of Christ on the cross, dying for our sins, taking the curse of the world upon himself, and then resurrecting, showing that life has triumphed over death and salvation is ours. Amen. Amen. And yet, even in that, Jesus sticks around for a little bit. And what does he do? Is there more work to be done? Apparently, there is. He says that I'm going to send my spirit upon you, and the spirit being upon you is not only upon you, but within you. We see now that the spirit or the presence of God takes up residence where? Within us. This is the power of Pentecost. God, in the beginning of scripture, in Genesis, God is where? Heaven, then Eden, then they get kicked out of Eden, then God's in heaven, and then you see the movement of the location of the presence of God in the ephod that the priest wears. And then from there to the Ark of the Covenant and, and from the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle and in the temple. And, and, and then years pass and then there's Jesus who comes on the scene. Now God is in Jesus. And, and then Jesus gives this startling teaching in Luke 17, 21, where Jesus says the kingdom or the realm of God is in you. Look at the movement of this location. And then finally, Pentecost. There's assurance. The realm of God has now come within the people. This is startling. And you see here in verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. When God is allowed and invited through our openness to the Spirit to permeate our existence, there's sudden good that begins to happen. There's sudden demonstration that begins to well up. And it's through our openness and receptiveness to the Spirit of God. I came to encourage you today to know that you might be in the middle of something hectic. You might be in the middle of a crazy life situation. But when you're connected to heaven, there is some sudden good that can appear in your life. There's sudden good that can blast you out of a chronic problem and lead you into your beautiful place. There's a beautiful place that God has for you. And if you are in a dark place, just know that you won't be there forever. There's something in you that is leading you further. Verse 3, we see here, and it says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Upon how many? Each of them. There is a power that God has made available just for you. In God's eyes, we're all special. Verse 4 says what? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. God, again, is showing us. God has made a move. The move is where? Now taking up residence within Now, we've heard many uh, forms of describing what it means to begin to speak with other tongues. But today, you can hold that in your heart and mind. I want to submit to you a deeper way of viewing this. When we look at this passage on an esoteric level, we discover some hidden meaning that applies to our inner life. From a metaphysical standpoint, other tongues is related to your inner speech. Somebody say inner speech. speech. It's related to your inner speech or your subjective word. Say subjective word. 
What are you saying about yourself within yourself? What are you saying within yourself about yourself, God, others, and life? That is your subjective word. And I submit to you today that this is an area in your life that the spirit wants to empower. You see, the tongue is your spiritual creative faculty. This is inclusive of your inner speech. Inner speech is the same thing as your subjective word. Now notice in verse four, again, it says that the spirit gave them utterance. The spirit empowered their speech. The power wasn't necessarily in the syllables that they were uttering, but it was in the spirit energy behind it. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power or in the ability of the tongue. The spirit empowers you and me to manifest life and love, even in the face of death and hate. The spirit is empowering their speech here. And right in the midst of this understanding, we see that Jesus says the kingdom or the realm of God is within you. So the tongue is within you, the realm is within you, so there is power and authority in you, but we might not know how to use it. And we might not be aware of it. And even when we do become aware of it, we might forget. So Jesus gives us something really great to work with in Mark chapter 11 to show us how to put into practice or how to enact this realm within us through the Spirit. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus is using nature to, exp to, to explain spiritual truth. He's using trees and mountains to explain a spiritual truth. Jesus is talking to an inanimate object, the tree. So the day before, earlier in Mark chapter 11, Jesus and the disciples are approaching a fig tree. This fig tree has leaves on it, but there's no fruit. Jesus walks up to it thinking he's going to find fruit. When he gets up to the tree, he doesn't find any fruit. And so this tree is like a deceptive tree because with fig trees in this part of the world, when the leaves appear, the fruit appears at the same time. So the fact that there were leaves on the tree meant that there should be fruit on it. Jesus walks up to it, doesn't see any fruit. There's a problem. There's a conflict. What does he do? He speaks to it. As a speaking spirit, Jesus knew the authority of his word was respected in all of creation. He speaks to it. Nothing happens at that moment. They come back the next day, and Peter says, look, with astonishment, the fig tree you cursed has withered. He was astonished because when Jesus spoke to it, nothing happened. At least he thought nothing happened. But came back around to it and something did happen. There was no immediate perceptible effect. It wasn't until the next day that Peter noticed that what Jesus had said the day before actually had produced a result. Now in this example, Jesus is showing us, you and me, that as a speaking spirit, what we believe and say can influence a situation. Are you with me? Yes. Now, 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 scholars look at this tree, and scholars, biblical scholars suggest that Jesus' cursing of the tree was a prophetic pronouncement over the politics of the nation of Israel and the surrounding Roman Empire. There was deception in their present-day politics. For the nation of Israel, there were political leaders that may have looked attractive, to many from a distance. But when they got up close, they saw that the tree had no fruit. The leaves were telling them from afar that it would satisfy their needs, that it, would, it, that, that it existed to make life better for them. But when they got up close to that tree, they saw that if it were up to that tree, they would have starved. I'm talking about the politics of the nation of Israel in Jesus' day. Jesus cursed that structure from the root and it withered. And so as a speaking spirit, Jesus knew that he must speak to the problem and that it would hear and respond to the authority of his word. Jesus gives us a representation of how to deal with the conflicts of life. What are you saying about that conflict that you're dealing with? What is your subjective word about that conflict that you're dealing with? Are you saying, oh, this is going to take me under? 
Oh, I just can't handle this. Oh, I just can't see my way around this. Oh, I'm going to get through this. Oh, this is not the end of the tunnel. Oh, there's light here. Oh, something good is going to happen through this situation. Oh, this does not have the best of me. Oh, I am an overcomer. I've got it. God's got me and all is well and this is going to be... You see the difference and the movement in the inner speech. There was a movement from despair to victory. And there is an authority in you that must direct the movement of that inner speech. I love what Emmett Fox said in his book, The Sermon on the Mount, when it comes to these kinds of things. He said, with a new difficulty of any kind, it is the reception that you give it mentally and the attitude that you adopt towards it in your own thought that completely determine its effect upon you. That is what matters. What matters to you, truly, is not people or things or conditions in themselves, but the thoughts and beliefs that you hold concerning them. Amen. That's dynamic. Amen. And in that vein, Jesus comes along and answers and says, have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Have faith in God. Now, if you get to what the Greek translation here is, there are other biblical translations of this verse that really pull out what the intent was. Literally, have the faith of God. In other words, have faith in God's ability to work through you. Notice, people, Jesus didn't say have faith in God and then do nothing. He said your faith in God demands active responsibility and stewardship from you and I. How important is faith when it comes to being a speaking spirit? In the conflicts of life, ladies and gentlemen, faith becomes not a cop-out, but your greatest asset. Let's look at the deeper meaning of the word faith. The Greek transliteration here is pistis. Pistis, which is a fidelity of belief, a faithfulness of assurance, a persistence of belief. Can you repeat? Persistence of belief. And look at Hebrews 11 and 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have a question. What can't you see? You know, you can't see the wind. It's powerful, it's strong, it's mighty. You see the effects of the wind. You see the results of the wind. But you can't see the wind. What else can't you see? You can't see your words. You can't see spirit. You can't see what you're Imagining with your physical eye. And I say to you that these unseen realities are the substance of the subjective word you are forming that's going out and producing a result. Faith, then, ladies and gentlemen, is persistent belief and loyal attention to an unseen reality. What is it? Faith is, is, is persistent belief and loyal attention to an unseen reality. Can you say that with me? Faith is persistent belief and loyal attention to an unseen reality. Remember, the fig tree didn't wither immediately, even when Jesus spoke to it. So you don't get thrown off if you don't see immediate results because your faith is working the whole time. I said, your faith is working the whole time. How important is faith when it comes to being a speaking spirit and engaging the power of your subjective word? Well, faith and belief are the substance of your spirit power. See, you receive the spirit by faith. You manifest the qualities of the spirit by faith. Faith both procures and demonstrates the spirit. Faith obtains and manifests the spirit. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, the potentials of God in you, God's spirit and realm in you, lie dormant until faith comes along to activate it. How important is faith? How important is faith? Faith is the key that unlocks the power of God's spirit and realm to work in your everyday life. Faith awakens the spirit's power within to produce without. Say amen, somebody. Faith enables the, the realities of, of, of God's realm within to be able to manifest in your life. Say amen. amen. Faith is the connecting link between the latent possibilities of God and their materialized expression in your life. 
Faith is the pipeline from the inner infinite storehouse to the outer world of manifestation. Faith is the avenue through which mere possibilities become demonstrable realities. Faith causes to come alive that which was asleep or dormant. Faith is what we need to live. One great mystic said, faith in God is measured by confidence in yourself. Now, if you look at that on an egotistical level, it makes no sense. But when you look at it on an esoteric inner level, knowing that the realm of God is within you, how could you claim to have faith? and not respect the authority that God says is in you. When you have a dilemma, the first thing to do is not to scratch on the outside and scrape on the outside for solutions and answers. It's to go within. The first thing to do when you have a dilemma is go within. Problems have a way of placing a demand on our faith. So we shouldn't just go through problems, we should grow through problems. I love what Howard Thurman said in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. He said, Jesus recognized with authentic realism that anyone who permits another to determine the quality of his inner life gives into the hands of the other the keys to his destiny. If a man knows precisely what he can do to you, what epithet he can hurl against you in order to make you lose your temper, your equilibrium, then he can always keep you under subjection. There's got to be a domain of inner strength that rises up within you if we are going to live victorious lives. Mark 11, 23 points us to the heart of this victory, of being a speaking spirit and living a victorious life. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, truly I tell you, if you say, if you say, this Greek transliteration of say is lego, lego, which is to say, to speak, affirm over, to point out with words, yet it also is intend to mean or mean to say. So intention and meaning are embedded in this word say. What your subjective word is, is a part of this saying. And he says, if you say to this mountain, if you say to this mountain, how many of you have experienced mountains in life? You've experienced setbacks or blockages of some kind that prevent your good from flowing forth. In life, we all experience some mountains or will experience some mountains. Maybe they're mountains of darkness and despair and desperation, if you say to this mountain, when people leave you and walk away, this mountain, when people spread lies and rumors and try to scandalize your name, this mountain, when the one you love the most hurts you the deepest, this mountain, when you're languishing in a setback and don't know if you'll ever make it forward, this mountain, when you keep getting a no, a denial, a rejection, a turn down, a dismissal, this mountain, am I on your row yet? When you feel so discouraged and this discouragement feels as though it could kill your soul, this mountain, when your body is ridden with sickness and you don't think you can get well, that's a mountain. When the doctor's report gives you no hope, this mountain, when it doesn't seem like there's enough money to make ends meet, this mountain, When you experience job loss or dried up stream of income, this mountain, what's your mountain? What's your mountain? Don't let this mountain stop you. Did you hear me? Don't let this mountain stop you. Do not stop at the point of your hurt, ladies and gentlemen, because the spirit of faith wells up within you and declares these mountains have to move. This is not my final destination. The mountain you faced is not your final destination. Whatever you're dealing with is not your final answer. I know about this personally. I have personal experience with this. Last year was the most challenging year of my life. I went through a divorce, and it was necessary and good, 
But let me say this, there were many challenges to navigate, and I did not want to be a very sad and unfortunate horror story, because I have two young children, we have two young children, and so throughout that process, my inner dialogue was, it's all working out wonderfully well. It's all working out wonderfully well in the most harmonious way for the highest good of all. It's all working out wonderfully well in the most harmonious way for the highest good of all. And that is the subjective word that I began to form and speak and believe. And when I tell you that my former wife and I today are very good friends, that is a demonstration of that word being made manifest. Also, last year, I came out and publicly revealed myself as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Amen. And this, this was a mountain. Because I said, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with my life, with my friends, with my family, with my career, with my employment, uh, with my su sustainability? What's going to happen? All the worst came into my mind. And then I remembered, wait a minute, you know the truth. What's the truth? The truth is that you're a speaking spirit and there's power in your subjective word. So I began to say, something wonderful is happening. Something wonderful is happening to me now. Something wonderful is happening to me now. Something wonderful is happening to me now. And now I'm standing before you. <laughs> Something wonderful happened. Verse 23 says, be taken up and thrown into the sea. This, this, this be taken up and thrown into the sea is a representation of the disintegration and the dissolving of your problem. Can you see that mountain dissolving and disintegrating? Can you see that mountain dissolving into its native nothingness? Can you see yourself beyond the mountain? When you can see yourself beyond the mountain and by faith see it melting into its native nothingness, in that moment your spirit is speaking. Your spirit is speaking when you can see yourself beyond the mountain. And in that moment, your spirit is saying to the mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And what did Jesus say? That if you say that and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. There are some things being done for you as you sit here today. I join my faith with yours and I declare that any chronic problem that has tried to grip a hold of your life, we begin to agree today for the disintegration and the dissolution of those chronic problems. That is not your final destination. That is not your final place. I see you beyond this mountain. I see you beyond this problem. Say it with me, I see myself beyond this mountain. Oh yeah, I see myself beyond this problem. And you know what? It looks pretty good. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Heart in this verse, heart, heart. And shall not doubt in the heart. The heart is the soul of the mind, the fountain and seat of the thoughts, the passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors, heart. Heart is rooted here and connected with what some call the subconscious mind. Heart, heart, that subjective realm, the realm of the subjective word. Because Matthew 12 and 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's what you say that's coming from the depths of your heart that produce. Not just those things we blab and say, oh, no, no. But what's connected to your heart? What's going on deep within you? Because whatever you deeply feel and believe, you activate within your experience. Whatever you deeply feel and believe, you activate within your experience. This is your subjective word, ladies and gentlemen. This is the realm of the subconscious. It's the realm of the heart. It's where subjective words and images abide. It's the inner realm. It's where your subjective word is formed and released. 
Here's what we want to just settle down with. Repeated words and thought images clothed in feelings become beliefs in the subconscious mind and heart. And from there, it discharges in action and manifestation. I want you to repeat that with me. Repeated words and thought images clothed in feelings become beliefs in the subconscious mind and heart. And from there, it discharges in action and manifestation. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you see, life is not only happening to you, but life is happening through you. Hallelujah. Edgar Guest wrote an amazing poem that was featured in Robert Collier's The Secret of the Ages, and it says, you can do as much as you think you can, but you'll never accomplish more. If you're afraid of yourself, young woman or man, there's little for you in store. For failure comes from the inside first, it's there if we only knew it. And you can win, though you face the worst, if you feel that you're going to do it. Here's another example of how this has come to pass. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1967, when he was isolated in Jamaica, he was working on a final manuscript of where do we go from here. And in that book, he said, every man lives in two realms, the internal and the external. He said in 1967, our problem today is that we have allowed the internal to become lost in the external. It was in 1963 that Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Birthed an intention, had a dream. And it was 46 years later in 2009 when that dream manifested in the form of President Obama giving his inaugural address. There was an intention. It didn't happen right away. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, it didn't happen right away. But things manifest from within out. Mark 11:24. 24. So I tell you, our last verse. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. You are letting forth prayers constantly, whether you know it or not. You are asking and calling for things, events, situations, people constantly. Where is this prayer taking place? It's taking place in the subjective realm. It's taking place as you are a speaking spirit. It's taking place as you release intentions, beliefs, and subjective words, and thought images, and desires. It's taking place there, and it's causing you to triumph or not but the realm of God is within you. The ability is there. And I believe the spirit of God wants to empower your inner ability so that you can experience victory in life. Amen. Here is a technique for directing your inner speech. This technique is this, and it's what I use. It helps me, just one technique. There's plenty that you can find in scripture, plenty that Pastor Jeff actually releases every week. I hope we catch it. But technique for directing your inner speech. Something wonderful is happening through me now. Say this within yourself in the morning, at different intervals during the day, and before dropping off to sleep. But pay particular attention to what you say within yourself before dropping off to sleep. Because when you drop off to sleep, the subconscious, that heart, is then opened up and you are forming your subjective word very strongly. So pay a particular attention to your feelings and your beliefs and your inner dialogue, particularly before dropping off to sleep. But your subjective word and this word goes forth and it correlates a myriad of space-time events for its fulfillment. I just came to encourage you this morning to know that as a speaking spirit, you believe you receive when you pray before there's any external evidence. As a speaking spirit, the intentions, desires, beliefs, and words that you release are producing an effect. As a speaking spirit, your energy field gives off a message that attracts and repels situations, circumstances, and events. You are a speaking spirit. I am a speaking spirit, and today we speak life. Today we speak love. I declare over you today, people of God, that you are decreeing and declaring the good, that you are disentangling from the problem, and you are aligning yourself with the solution. You are disentangling from the drama of the 
of the, of the toil and the struggle, and you're aligning yourself with God's blessed, beautiful result. I see you beyond this mountain. Can you see yourself beyond this mountain? Do you see yourself walking in God's love? Do you see yourself walking in God's light and beauty? Do you see yourself victorious? Do you see yourself walking in the love and the truth that God has ordained for you? I see it. Oh, I see it. I see life journey ascending. I see life journey going further, going higher. There's new good, new territory to explore. And I see us going forward, bringing the life and the light of God to all who will receive and accept. And I proclaim over your life and over my life that there is new sudden good to appear. There's new sudden good to appear. There's something wonderful happening to you, something wonderful happening through you, something beautiful, something amazing that will make your soul say, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. God, you're wonderful. God, we praise you today. And so this is your authority as a speaking spirit, the power of your subjective word. Amen. Amen.